It seems that the eternal struggle in Commander deck building is somehow fitting everything your deck wants and needs into just 100 slots. Some brewers will agonize for weeks over their cuts, and those last few cuts can be exceptionally brutal. Do you really need all these single target removal spells? Maybe just cut a ramp spell or two. Or maybe just cut a few lands. Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today we have another lesson from CEDH. CEDH is a metagame within the Commander format that sits at one extreme with highly consistent, highly efficient decks. Not all cards are equally powerful in all formats, or even in all metagames, but there are lessons to be learned from how people are using some of the most powerful cards in Magic's history. To actually fit everything you want into your commander deck, it sometimes feels like you need 150 slots, or even 200, not just 100. And one of those things that you'll notice when you're looking at CDH decks and when talking to CDH brewers is that every slot in a commander deck is a really precious resource. And this isn't a foreign concept in deck building in the greater commander population in general. Many content creators have put forth their own templates for deck building. I've always enjoyed the old 8x8 theory, for example, and many players make use of the command zone template. Even these templates can feel like it's impossible to fit everything in. And that's where the concepts of flexibility, synergy, and layering come into play. Before we get started, I just want to thank you for joining us today. If you've enjoyed this or any of our other episodes, please don't forget to give a like on your viewing or listening platform of choice. You can leave us a comment. And don't forget to subscribe. Let's begin by describing what makes a card flexible. And a good way to think of it is to consider how likely a card is to be useful when you top deck it. For example, Smelt is a 1 mana red instant that can destroy an artifact, while Nature's Claim is a 1 mana green instant that can destroy an artifact or an enchantment. Very simple. Nature's Claim can hit both enchantments and artifacts, making it much more likely to be a live draw when you top deck it. As you have a wider variety of permanent types you could potentially remove with Nature's Claim versus Smelt. Let's compare both of these now to the one mana instant speed answer that sees the most play in CDH, which is probably Chain of Vapor. This blue instant can bounce any permanent type, and the drawback can often even be used to your advantage, where you bounce opponent 1's value piece and then force them to also sacrifice a land to bounce the actual threat that opponent number 2 has. There's a reason why Beast Within, Chaos Warp and Anguish on Making are so commonly seen in the decks that can run them at casual tables. 3 mana to answer any permanent type at instant speed is incredible. They fit the quote unquote template slot of answers a creature and answers a non creature permanent. And you don't really want to go too low with your count of answers, of course. It does take some fine tuning to find the right balance for your deck. Some decks may have more vulnerabilities they need to have answers for. Others are more straightforward in their approach and can be more agnostic in their opponent's game plan. A piece of advice that I would give to players who are looking to upgrade their first deck or pre-con is to look at their suite of answers and try to swap out the more limited answers that the deck provides for more flexible ones. A good way to assess a card's flexibility is very similar to quadrant theory from limited resources. In Commander though, instead of looking at whether you're ahead, behind, at parity, so on and so forth, I would instead look at those three stages of the game that we often talk about. Getting ready, all set up, and going for it. I like to ask myself how useful a card is when I'm in each of those stages of the game, and what it's like when I'm in those stages and my opponents are in those various stages, either ahead of me or behind me. Another way to fit more of the effects that your deck needs into fewer card slots is to pick cards which synergize more directly with your deck's game plan. A very basic example of this comes from a tribal deck. So let's say as an example, we're building an elf deck. We want lots and lots of elves we can benefit from with our commander, so it's probably a good idea to run ramp in the form of mana dorks like Lanoir elves, Fintorn elves, and Elvish mystic, so that our ramp pieces provide all the elf creatures we could want on the battlefield. They provide more synergy than just being ramp spells. We probably also want to be on cards like Reclamation Sage as an answer to non-creature permanence, a draw engine in the form of Beast Whisper, and if we're in at least Golgari colors, Shaman of the Pack may go in as one of our win cons. They're all doing something useful for our game plan, and they're also elves. 
Now this does get a little bit trickier when we start to move out of the realm of simple examples, but why don't we try looking at one of the new Dominaria United Legends? The Ever-Changing Dane is a 3-mana 3-3 in Esper Colors with an activated ability of 1, Sacrifice Another Creature. The Ever-Changing Dane becomes a copy of the Sacrifice Creature, except it has this ability. This suggests a number of different types of decks, and they're all kind of cool because they're different than the typical clones deck, where you're getting a lot of value off of ETBs in that particular deck. Instead, we could potentially use the Dane as a form of pseudo-haste, to get attack triggers or combat damage trigger effects more quickly. Why not sacrifice the Archon of Cruelty to the Dane, get its attack trigger and ETB on the same turn? You could also get around the wording of some old reanimation spells, which require you exiling the creature at the end of turn, such as Dawn of the Dead, a definite pet card of mine. You can run a classic reanimator shell where you bring back a big beefy creature, get a swing in with it, and then, before the end of turn when it would be exiled, just sacrifice the creature to the ever-changing Dane. Or you could simply go with a Death Triggers Matters deck, maybe just run cards like Archon of Justice, which is a pretty sweet source of repeatable removal for any permanent. Each of these effects brings a lot of additional synergy to your deck's main game plan, and it will revolve around the Dane getting set up to shenanigans while still providing the basics of interaction that your deck will need. This brings us to the final concept of this episode, the idea of layering. And I'm not referring to the actual rules for layers in the Magic Comprehensive Rules, which are an entirely different thing. Instead, layering in this case refers to how one or more parts of your win condition might overlap with another one of your win conditions. In many CDH decks, for example, Dockside Extortionist is an easy route to infinite mana. You might run it in a deck that has both Emil the Blessed and Team or Sabretooth, because Dockside has the ability to go infinite with either of those cards easily, and really goes infinite with a bunch of other cards also really easily, Dockside is kind of a really powerful card. In this way, Dockside layers very well, as you can draw either one of those two or 20 different possible cards which will enable you to generate infinite treasures. Underworld Breach is another common win condition in CDH, and in this case, the enchantment layers well with lines that include Brain Freeze, as you can pay for the escape cost with Underworld Breach by milling yourself before the storm count is high enough to mill your opponents out. And Breach also layers well with Wheel of Fortune and other similar wheels, because not only are you drawing a fresh seven cards, but you're putting a bunch of cards into your graveyard, which you can then use to pay the escape costs for cards that you want to play with Underworld Breach, like a Wheel of Fortune. In a very specific sense, Layering is a concept meant to describe how an A plus B win condition is going to also allow you to win with A plus C, or A plus D, or B plus D, creating a larger number of potential lines and permutations you can use to get to your ultimate win. But in a broader sense, we can apply this to a lot of our early arguments about what makes a card flexible, or how a card has synergy with the rest of our deck. The question to ask yourself is this. How likely is the card to be useful for your immediate game plan when you draw it? How many different scenarios are you going to experience in a game of Commander over the lifespan of your deck that this card will be useful in? Being able to concoct reasonable scenarios where a card may be useful is something that comes with experience, so don't be afraid to ask for advice from other people. It is a difficult skill to learn, but an incredibly useful tool to have in your tool belt while you are brewing decks. Considering this, one of the things that makes Dockside so good is that it's amazing in the getting ready stage of the game just as a ritual to eke out a little bit of extra mana. And in the all set up stage of the game, it can catapult us ahead of what our opponents are doing and then still enable some powerful win conditions even when you've already cast it and profited from it once. It's even good when you're going for it. Another way to think of it is how often your win conditions are a dead draw for you. If a card like your win condition is only good in the very specific scenario of I'm trying to win the game with the other half of my combo ready to go, it layers poorly compared to a card like Dockside Extortionist, which basically is good in every scenario except the very specific pod where everyone is playing mono green creature or land based ramp and everyone already has a collector oof in play. And that will about do it for our discussion on flexibility, synergy, and layering with your card choices. 
As usual, there's a lot more that we could potentially discuss here. This could potentially go on for hours trying to outline all the different scenarios you would need to play out, trying to weigh both the actual flexibility of what's printed on the card versus the opportunity cost to actually cast the spell. And that's before we even consider things like making choices for your specific metagame. Why don't you tell us in the comments what you think one of the most useful hidden gems you've found is that was perfect in your metagame? Is there a specific answer you've really loved? Or a draw spell that just always seems to draw you buckets of cards that nobody else seems to have heard us? You can let us know on YouTube, where we are Gemstone Mind Podcast. You can add us on Twitter, where we are at Gemstone Mind MTG. Or you can send us an email, gemstonemindpodcast at gmail.com. Until next time, I'm John, and this is Gemstone Mine.